I'm falling on my knees Offering all of me Jesus, your all my heart is living for I'm falling on my knees Offering all of me Jesus, your all my heart is living for Yes, I wait for you <laughs> Yes, I wait for you Yes, I wait for you Yes, I wait for you. Ooh. I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me. Jesus, your all. My heart is living for Jesus, your all. My heart is living for Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Pastor Clint Ross, I see you. <laughs> I had a powerful conversation with Pastor Clint Ross years ago. He's an apostle in South Africa. And such a blessing. I still remember your wisdom. At that table, we was in Dr. Mike Murdoch's conference room. I think that was year 2017. 2017. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship 
His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. There's a mighty river flowing. There's a mighty river flowing in this place. And it's full of passion. Full of power, full of glory, is full of grace. Mighty river, mighty river, fill this place. Mighty river, oh mighty river, fill this place. There's a mighty river flowing. Mm -hmm. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. <laughs> you are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. I'll sing again. You are so good to me. <laughs> That's a shame I don't know this song. <laughs> the lyrics, hold on. You are so good to me. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. By the way, you're going to enjoy this word, saints. I'm going to tell you something like this. You notice how powerful it is to hide the word in your heart. Because the purpose of you hiding the word of you in your heart, it is to quicken you constantly. So that you would remain in the spirit. Because that's what John 6.63 says. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So... How does King Jesus get you in the spirit through the word? While the spirit is introducing the word to you, that's how the spirit is entering you. So the more you meditate the word, the more you're dominated by the spirit because the spirit is really the word. See, when God created words, he created it as a transference system to impart his spirit into a thing, into our environment. So, you know, a lot of people use words, but what was the real purpose of words? God created words because he wanted to transfer his spirit into a place, into a person, into a thing. And so he created the word system for transference. That's why in life, you got to be careful what you are, what words you allow to enter you. Like if you look at in the life of these last couple years, the word that has been emphasized a lot has been plagues, viruses. And so these words have entered into people. So if you meet somebody in the public, they're scared, they're nervous because that's the word that have entered in them. Meanwhile, <laughs> when I go in public, I'm at peace. <laughs> I'm not worried about no disease. I'm not worried about no viruses 
because the word that I have chosen to receive is a word of peace. I think that's John 14 that says that my peace I give unto you, not as the world give peace. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The peace that the Lord gives, um, and then what that say, uh, is that Colossians 3.15? Let, uh, let the peace of God rule in your hearts and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The peace of God rule in your heart. So I think that's Colossians 3.15. But that peace is dealing with your hole in your mind. Your mind is not drifting off on things that Satan is saying. That's what really peace is. You know that, right? Peace means that Satan cannot interject his words to you. That's what peace is. Peace means that Satan cannot converse with your soul. That's what really peace is. So saints, when you're in peace, that means that Satan doesn't have access to talk to your mind and tell it things. Your mind is guarded. So when you're in the peace of God, the reason why peace is really wholeness is because God does not let evil or Satan dominate how he thinks. So when you're in that mode of guarding your mind and keeping it in the words of God, you're in peace, you're in wholeness. You should never worry about things. You should never be bothered about things. When, you're, when your mind is not right, you're becoming filthy because it's a word system that makes your mind not right. It's a word system. It's a word system. So when your mind is not right, it's because there is a word system entering into you that wasn't supposed to be in there. Those are not the words of God. John 15, three says, you are clean because of the words I speak to you. Now, for it to say that you are clean because of the words I speak to you, that means that King Jesus has a word system that cleanses the soul. Now, when the soul is clean, you have inspiration to do divine things. When your soul is filthy, you shut down. Filth produces stagnation. Filth produces procrastination, filth. Filthiness is the mother of stubbornness. Filthiness is the mother of stubbornness. So whenever you're filthy, you can't move with God. You move from God. When you're filthy, when you're clean, you move towards God and you move with God. Why do you have to move towards him? Because James chapter four, verse eight says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Are you seeing that? So James four, eight, James four, eight, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. See, then it also says, uh, cleanse your hands, cleanse, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, cleanse. See, you move towards God in that cleaning place. And then it says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, you're purifying your heart as you're moving towards God. So the purity levels is in moving towards God. When you shut down, that means that you're filthy because the only way you can be clean is by moving towards God. Are you seeing that? It's, it didn't say God going to draw nigh to you. It says draw nigh to God. God already drew nigh to you in John 3, 16. Are you seeing that? God already drew near, nigh to you. Because when he sent his only begotten son, when he came down in human flesh, that was God manifesting the flesh. John chapter one, John chapter one, John chapter one in the gospels, with him appearing, becoming made flesh from the word, this is all him drawing nigh to you. The cross is God drawing nigh to you. Your cross is you drawing nigh to God. If you don't draw nigh to God, that means that you reject your cross. Your cross is really you drawing nigh to God. God drew nigh to you through his cross. You draw nigh to God with your cross. So if you reject your cross, you're not drawing nigh to God. If you refuse the assignment that God has for you, that means that you're accepting filth. Filthiness is the rejection of instruction. 
Filthiness is the rejection of mentorship, training. The more unlearned you are, the more wicked you remain. The more unlearned you are, the more wicked you remain. Wickedness is being introduced to truth, but not producing truth. <laughs> you are so good to me. You lead me to the truth. You are my father who loves me. Care is very dangerous. Caring people are nosy people. Caring people, they rebel against God often because cares create a calendar for your steps. Care creates a schedule for your thoughts. Care is a strategy that Satan uses to establish wrong focus. Care is so dangerous because it, the more you care, the more you operate in pride. When you're in care, you celebrate the wrong people. When you're in care, you give gifts to the wrong people. When you're in care, you bless the wrong people. You defend the wrong people. Care is dangerous. When you are in care, your prayer life becomes stagnated with people that really don't want to change. <laughs> are you hearing me? Care. When you're in care, your prayer life becomes stuck because you'll even go to God continuously because of that care. And Meanwhile, the father will want to shift you to something else that needs to be done by you. Care also causes you to look at others and disregard yourself. There's a lot of people that care about other people. But they themselves are not even performing at the level that God wants them to perform. They're careful of what people are doing wrong, but they can't discern what they're doing wrong. They're careful of what other people are saying wrong, but they're not cautious that they're speaking deaf. They're careful of other people's mistakes, but they're not conscious of their own errors. Care could magnify someone else's weaknesses while you disregard your own iniquities. You know how many people that care for other people, they say, I'm winning them to the Lord, I'm winning them to the Lord. But while you're saying you're winning them to the Lord, you're not even one to the Lord. The Lord is still fighting you on doing things. The Lord is still cleaning you. And you're so careful about what other people are doing and you yourself have not arrived. You don't have the finances that you're supposed to have. You don't have the help that you're supposed to have. You don't even know how to keep your mind in 24 hours. But yet you care about how someone else is living. You're saying that their lifestyle is wrong because you're looking at their fruits, but you're not looking at your own mindset. Your own mind can't stay joyful for a whole 24 hours. Why can't you stay inspired for a whole 24 hours? But yet you can look at someone else's life and talk about how they all messed up, but you can't discern your own mess. The Bible said, pick the beam out your own eye. It didn't say that you can't discern someone else's beam, but make sure that you pick the beam out your own eye first. Care will have you trying to do surgery on someone else while you are broken. I know a lot of people that care about a lot of people. They care. They care so much. But there's stuff in their life that's not fixed. There's stuff in their life that they can't even discern. Care will have you undone in your progress, undone in your perfection, undone in your uh, completion. You got to be careful because care will always give you a summary of others. They'll never give you a summary of yourself. You hear me? When you operate in care, you'll have a summary about what everybody else is doing. You'll know their life. You'll know what they're doing wrong, but you won't see the wrong that God is getting out of you. 
That's why God said, cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. You're supposed to cast your cares. You're not supposed to carry them. Even in the Gospels, it said, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. Take no thought for your life. A lot of times you're taking thoughts for things and you yourself is left undone. Bible says you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's Philippians 2.12. Satan has been successful in having people focus on who needs to be saved and not even realize that they're not saved. You're not delivered. Now, you could be delivered with one quickening and realize, hey, I am delivered. And then start walking in it. But what I'm saying is, manifestation-wise, you don't be delivered. You still got attitudes. Some of y'all got attitudes. Some of y'all got attitudes that's not of God. You got attitudes, you got things about yourself that's not of God. And then, if you ever want to see who you really are, patience is how God tests you. Some of y'all don't got no patience. You don't like to wait. If you got to wait for a period of time, you start getting eager. You start getting upset. But that's how God breaks you through patience. So anything you want to have sex, he won't let you have sex. You want a lot of money, he won't let you have a lot of money. You want a big old house, he won't let you have a big, big old house. He'll let you wait it out to kill you. Some of you are, you had a lot of sex lives in your earlier years. You had a lot of sex. Now you're in a place, you up there, you was a little girl talking about you had a boyfriend having sex with your boyfriend. You crazy. Some of y'all was, was uh, 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 <laughs> some of y'all was up there, men, men talking about this, my girlfriend, having sex with your girlfriend, young. And now God up there got you waiting. And then you up there crying out. Yeah, he gonna have you crying out because you violated something. You violated it before time. I wasn't 23. I was 23 years old when I first had sex. 23 years old. I waited two decades to have sex. And I don't look like no string cheese. <laughs> Oftentimes, God have you wait things out because you violated it before. You violated it. You violated the law of it. So God has to kill you to purify you so that when he gives it to you, you'll do it righteously and purely. Are you seeing that? You could violate things. So God will kill you through patience. You got to wait it out because you violated it. When you violate money, you don't sow money. You take money, you get income tax, you make sure your children good, you good, you don't make sure God good, you don't even think about sowing a seed. So when God, he, he puts you through patience financially to wait it out. He puts you through financial processing and training because you, you have gotten money before. You have gotten finances before and you took the finances and you used it in order for you yourself to operate in the mentality of self-sufficiency, self-centeredness. And because you violated it, how God purges you, he pits you through patience. God purges you through patience. Do you know how God gets all that thing out of you that's not of him? He pits you through patience. How does God purify your heart? He pits you through patience. The patience is how God kills the demons that you have entertained in your past. God kills your demons through patience. And some of you are, you always get angry when you're being tried through patience. And that's the way that God purges you. That's the way that God cleans you. That's the way that God takes away all of the evil, all of the iniquity, all of the wrong things that's not supposed to be in you. He takes it away through patience. He takes away all the traits that he did not give to you through patience. He takes away all of the evil mindsets through patience. He takes away all of the wrong characteristics, all the wrong attitudes, all of the anxiety, all of the flesh. All of the darkness, all of the wickedness, all of the witchcraft, all of the idolatry. He takes it away through patience. Everything that God does to deliver you, he uses the method of patience to do it. 
Some of y'all, you wonder why you feel horny and God not sending somebody for you to do this. Because you're going through patience. You was filthy sexually all your life. You did what you wanted to do sexually all your life. Now God, he killing that. Are you seeing that? Financially, you was filthy, uh, defiled. You followed your own financial pattern. Now he kills you financially. Seed sowing is the death of your soul financially. Because your soul already had its own cravings, its own desires. And saying, so we not only talk about sex, let me hop over on that food. Because some of you are, your demon is food. You can't stop eating. Your demon is food. Your demon is gluttony. When your demon is gluttony, God will call you to a fast. When you gaining all those pounds, God will call you to fast. Because there's something that happens when you keep eating that actually makes you more fleshly. I'm not talking to you skinny behind folk up on here. Because some of y'all skinny, that's a sign that you don't eat enough. I'm saying that sometimes, and you as a child of God, you'll look at yourself and be like, I need to lose some weight. No, no, that's God telling you that. You see what I'm saying? That's God telling you that because what God's saying is this is something that has power over you. You can't stop eating. I'm not talking to you skinny folk up in here. If you're 130 <laughs> If you use 130 pounds and below, I'm not talking to you, Cletus. You hear me? I don't want to hear no yes, Lord, from no 130 pounders on here. If you're 140 pounds, I'm not talking to you, Cletus. You hear me? I'm not talking to your big head self. Don't be talking about yes, Lord, hallelujah, glory, yes, wow. I don't want to hear that. I'm not talking to you. I'm saying that there are people that they are in a place where they can't stop eating because the devil is trying to get them to lose their esteem, their self-esteem, their confidence. You hear me? I'm talking about that the devil is messing with their... I'm, I'm going to tell you, do you know that there are some demons that have you eat and eat and eat and then they torment you about the weight that you have gained? Now, saints, I want you to hear me. Now, 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 what happens is now you step into oppression. Now you can't do what God says because your confidence is low, your mind is messed up, and you're operating in a demon spirit of gluttony that is now tormenting you about your eating decisions. Now, now it's affecting God and you because you can't listen to God if your heart not right. Are you hearing this? When your heart is not in a good place, if you don't have inspiration, you will harden your heart towards God and you won't listen to him. So you have to study how is there things in my life that's blocking off my receptivity to what God wants me to do because I'm operating in another spirit and this spirit, after it uses me, it torments me about what I did. Some of y'all keep on talking about you're going to lose weight. Lose the weight. Doggone it. Lose it. Lose it in Jesus' name. Lose the weight. Lose the weight tonight. Lose it today. You talking about you're going to lose the weight? Lose the weight right now. Lose it. Lose it. Lose it. Lose it. Lose all those pounds that you talking about you're going to lose. What you waiting for? Do it. Stop pitting it off for tomorrow like you ain't got no power. You got the power to lose how much weight you want to lose. You got the power to change however you want to change. Whatever you want to change in your life that's not of God, you got the power to loose it now. You got authority. You can loose your new body. You can loose your new mindset. You can loose your new, new, your new way of thinking, your new attitude. Do it now. Stop waiting until tomorrow. You're acting like you're powerless, like you don't have grace and glory moving towards you. Get it done. You that got plans to gain weight, gain the doggone weight. 
Eat. Stop talking about you got weight goals and then you won't finish your weight goals. Then we hop over to them other people. There's people that's trying to gain weight, lose weight. Then there's other people are talking about they're going to gain weight. You keep talking about you on gain weight. Gain the dog on weight. Eat. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord I receive an anointing to lose weight. Number one, for those of y'all on that end. And then you other people, I receive an anointing to gain weight. You got to receive an anointing. You got to receive a grace on you verbally. You say, prophet, well, how do I receive a grace? You do it verbally. You talk. You talk your way into the ability of God. That's why he gave you a mouth. Remember, a mouth was created for transactions and transferences. So you need a transaction. You need God to transfer his power to you so that he could teach your mind how to think about a thing. Saints, it is your mind that is deciding all the decisions you make. So once you receive the power of God in your mind, you're receiving really him talking to you repetitively about a divine wisdom strategy of how to reach your goal. When the Lord talks to your mind, that's the anointing. That's why 1 John 2.27, the anointing will teach you all things. That's the Holy Ghost. Remember King Jesus said in the gospels that the Holy Ghost will bring to your remembrance everything I've said unto you. The Holy Ghost is going to bring to your remembrance. That's what the anointing is. It's power for the mind. And instruction is power for the mind. Counsel is power for the mind. Some of y'all reject counsel. You get offended. You're not really smart. Counsel means that God is... He's stretching a rebuke. Did you catch what I just said? But some of y'all are too slow to re recognize that when God doing that in your life. You start getting angry because you're slow. Counsel is God stretching a rebuke. So when he counseling you, He's, he's rebuking you, but he's stretching it. He's explaining a lot of things. He, he's he's, he's over-talking. He's continuously talking about something that you missed. Some of y'all get weary when God counsel you. That's how much Satan has messed you up. Counsel mean that God is repetitively talking about the mistake you made and the mantle that you now have to correct it. You're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. But see, our generation so untaught. So we taught, oh, I didn't ask Jesus to forgive me, so it's over. That's not, it's not no over. It's not over. The Bible said work out your salvation. What happened when you work out? You don't feel good, doggone it. When you're working out, you get pain. When you're working out, you get sore. Some of y'all don't even get sore in your soul. That's why your soul don't change. You ain't got no muscles. Because your soul is not delivered. You up there won't work out your soul. Up there every time God go to work out your soul. No, I'm already forgiven. It's all underneath the blood. Yeah, it's underneath the blood till you want to do it again. We don't talk about that though. You love to say that it's underneath the blood. You forgiven until you do it again. So if it was underneath the blood, how the hell you doing the same thing that hell wants you to do? If it's underneath the blood. So that means that you was lying. 
Because you said that God forgave you. It was forgiven. It was under the blood. So if it's under the blood, why is in your decisions six months later? Why is in your decisions nine months later? If it's underneath the blood, then that means it should be underneath the blood. It shouldn't be seen in your behavior. It shouldn't be seen in your mindset. It shouldn't be seen in your words. It shouldn't be seen in your actions. It shouldn't be seen in your schedule. It shouldn't be seen in your idle time. It shouldn't be seen in your conversation. It shouldn't be seen in how you're thinking, how you're dreaming. It it shouldn't be seen if it's underneath the blood, how you deceive yourself. Oh, wicked and corrupt generation, the deceitfulness of the heart. It is very trifling and is very crafty. The deceitfulness of the heart, it makes you believe that you're clean and you're still filthy. Imagine a child playing in mud. They hop into the tub for two minutes and they come out and you say, no, go back in the tub. They say, mommy, I'm clean. I'm talking to y'all because I don't let my children play in the dirt. <laughs> Zendaya Glory Home, she ain't, I don't let her play on stuff like that. I'm just using that example. I don't let my daughter get her shoes clean, dirty. I don't let my daughter get her clothes dirty. And I rebuke her if she get her clothes dirty because I'm training her how to be a lady. She is a woman in a little girl's body. So I'm training her how to be a lady. I don't let her get her clothes messed up. I don't let her mess up her hair because I'm showing her. I don't let myself get messed up. You don't let yourself get messed up. I'm teaching her the graces of excellence. Because women are just little girls that grew up. So however you thought, if nobody ever checked you, you still think like that today. Some of you are as little girls, little boys, some of y'all didn't really get no whoopings. That's why when the Lord whoop you, it's so hard on you because nobody ever taught you the adequate of kingship, royalty, priesthoodness, the spirit of God, the spirit of grace. And that's okay because his mercy endure forever. And what the spirit does is he'll mold you and shape you. You got to learn that molding and shaping and make a decision that you're going to walk in it. Why would you hate God sculpturing you into his image? You love the image that the serpent gave you. You love the image, the picture you love the frame that Satan has housed the picture of your soul into. You love that image. You love the serpent and what the serpent has prescribed for you to lead you to death and eternal destruction. Or will you betray the system in which you're common with to receive an uncommon nature that's of God, that's of purity, that's of righteousness? That's Ephesians chapter three, verse 24 says, put on the new man that's created in true righteousness and holiness. Put on the new man. That's Ephesians. Ephesians chapter three, verse 24, put on that new man. Why you don't want to put on the new man? You love the old man so much. The old man is called the old man for a reason. It's old. That means that it's expired. Let me just say this to y'all. Some of y'all got old clothes. You need to throw them away. Some of y'all got clothes that you have for five years. You need to throw them away. And some of y'all, your old clothes smell like the old you. <laughs> throw away old clothes. I do that too. I do that too. And even though my clothes smell good and they look good, they look nice. If I have them for a long period of time, I throw them away. Because God gets tired of old. Some of y'all wear dirty shoes. You keep on wearing them dirty shoes. Your shoes and your mind is dirty. You, you're not even recognizing your dirty shoe, nor is you recognizing your dirty mind. If I tell your mind dirty, you're going to say that your mind not dirty. But you can't even recognize your shoe. Take them dirty shoes off and throw them in the garbage. 
Go buy you some new shoes and put them shoes on and take care of them so that your mind could see stewardship at work. Some of y'all wearing jewelry that done turn pink, turn yellow. Throw that mother suck ass away. <laughs> Throw the mother suck ass away. Throw it in the garbage real quick. You see it turning green and purple? Throw it away. Don't try to salvage it. Throw it away. It's not good for where God is taking you for you to agree with mediocre. You're not hearing me in here. Some of y'all, them days where you wake up and don't do your hair, them days are gone forever. Do your hair. Take the time to invest in yourself. Do your hair. Do your... Saints, every day I do my hair. Every day. If... Saints, I've had barbers tell me, you know, I would tell you to come to my barber shop, but you already got your barber. Who your barber is? I said, man, man, he charged five hundred dollars. They said, man, I see what he's saying, man. I see, I see, but who is he? Is he on Instagram? I said, yeah, he on Instagram. Well, what's his handle? I said, I don't know if you could handle his handle. You see, what I'm saying, I don't know if you could handle his handle. But he good, man. He good, man. You know, you check him out. Maybe another time, I I give you a business card. Meanwhile, I'm my own barber. I'm my own barber. And saints, let me tell you something. Every day I do my hair. Every day I do my hair. Whether I'm live or I'm not live. Every day I do my hair. Because I'm always live. <laughs> Even if I'm not live, I'm still live. Every day I do my hair. And saints, do you know when people meet me in public, they can't, they can't take no crazy pictures on me and post their social media tells oh, look at him here. They can't do that. Because if you meet me, I'm smelling good, all of that. <laughs> My shoes clean, all of that. It don't, it don't matter, it don't matter, it don't matter where you see me. And saints, I just thought about it. I haven't gone to Dollar General in about three years. <laughs> And I know why I haven't gone to Dollar General. Because that dollar mentality is something that mess you up. Saints, when God ready to bless you, you can't be cheap. Every time, well, what's the cheapest one? No, 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 I don't want to sleep in no cheap hotel. I don't want to sleep in no cheap hotel. I don't want to see yesterday's activities on the bed frame. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't want to see that on the bed frame. I don't want to see no flashbacks. And back, back flashes. <laughs> I don't want to see no back, back, uh, uh, back, uh, uh, flashbacks and no back flashes. I won't see none of it. I won't see none of it. I won't see none of it. I won't see none of them. None of it. Sometimes people, they say, what, what, what's the cheapest hotel? No, 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 what the cheapest hotel? You go to the cheapest hotel, you see fingerprints, you see all type of prints. <laughs> Moving along strong, I don't want to think about that. That's messed up my joy. I don't want to think about my own. It's the shoes. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> I'm looking for my friends. I'm looking for you. <laughs> Since you go to a wrong hotel and people start asking you, do you got a lighter? You know you're at the wrong hotel. You go to a location and they start, start trying to sell you stuff. You know you're at the wrong place. No. You go to a neighborhood. That person up there, no. Every neighborhood you go, people knows it anyhow, but. Holy Spirit wants you to take on the identity of his image and he's going to do it through sculpturing you by patience. You have to. Adapt to patience and love patience. 
practice patience. You're supposed to have patience perfected in you before God make you wealthy. Some of you all don't like the patience of minding your business. You all in everybody else's business and you can't recognize what's in your own domain. Huh? <laughs> You're in your own domain. You, you need to be in your own domain. You don't need to be studying what everybody else is doing. In um, in uh, First Thessalonians chapter four, verse eleven, it says that uh, you should you should uh, study to live a quiet life. Study to live a quiet life. My, and do your own business, working with your own hands as we have commanded you. Then 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 12 says that you should walk honestly towards those that are without, that you may have lack of nothing. Now, Thessalonians 4, 11 and 4, 12 are so powerful because it's telling you that minding your business is a part of your financial anointing. Stand focused on what God is producing in your house. Stand focused on what God is producing in your garden. Don't look at other people's garden and say, oh, their garden full of snakes. Oh, these snakes, we got to get these snakes. No, focus on your garden and make sure that your garden remains kept and tended. Keep and tend your garden. Don't worry about what's happening in other people's garden. Oh, their garden needs some fixing. Oh, we need to cut the grass in their garden. No, no. Keep your garden because while you go over and leave your garden to go cut their grass, your grass start growing, snakes start entering in, and then you so busy on looking at their grass that your grass got snakes until the snake bites you is the final place where you recognize that you had snakes in your grass. Not until you get bit. Not until the poisonous venom is on the inside of you. Stop worrying about people's business. Mind your own cotton picking business. Mind your business. Care about your soul. Care about your soul. And you know, we like to say, oh, well, prophet, what you telling me not to care about people? You Bible talk about we must love our neighbor as, as ourselves. But you, you love your neighbor as yourself. Are you hearing that? Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't even know the divine love of yourself. What's love for the self? Proverbs chapter four and on talked about keeping instruction. That's Proverbs four, verse uh, 13, I believe. 12 and 13. Uh, how do you love yourself? You keep the instruction of God. That's how you love yourself. You love yourself by keeping the instruction of God. You hear me? God wants you to keep his instruction. That's how you walk in loving God. You keep his instruction. That's how you do it. You can't say that I'm loving my neighbor as myself. And you don't even know how to love yourself. Because while you're studying your neighbor, you leave yourself undone. What's in your house that's supposed to be fixed? What about you as a woman that you haven't dealt with? What about you as a man that you haven't dealt with? Before you so quick to study and sculpture and examine people, examine yourself. Examine you. What's up with you? Are you free? Huh? Are you delivered? Are you set free? Huh? Huh? Have you made yourself clean before God? James 4, 8, cleanse yourselves, you sinners. The Bible say you cleanse yourself. Psalm 119, 9. How could a man cleanse his way? But by taking heed according to the word of God. So taking heed is your own decision. Deuteronomy 28 says you hearken diligently to my voice. Be 
Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 29. Deuteronomy 5, 29 says, oh, that they would have a heart in them that would fear me and keep my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their children. That's Deuteronomy 5, 29. Huh? Let's deal with that. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 29. Let's deal with that real quick. Let's deal with that. That's deep. Let's deal with it. Huh? Let's deal with that as a matter of fact. Deuteronomy 5, 29. Oh, that, oh, oh, that they had a heart in them that would fear me. That they would fear me and, and, and keep my commandments always. That it might be well with them and their children forevermore. Let's go there. Look, look, Deuteronomy 529. Look what God said. Oh, that there was such a heart in them. That there was such a heart in them. See what God looking for? He looking for a heart that will keep his commandments always. So when you talk about you fear God, let me tell you something. You can't fear God and still miss the mark. Fearing God means that you keep the commandments of God always. That means that even when nobody looking at you, when nobody praising you, when nobody is See, and, and that's what I'm saying. Us as leaders, see, when I'm a leader, you could look at me, right? See, you could look at me and say, okay, well, he the leader, so he got to keep himself. Meanwhile, you live up there rugged and evil lifestyles, and you still listening to me. That's wicked. Because if you recognize that it's not so much whether or not you're in leadership, that places a demand on you, it matters that God has called you. He has called you to himself. Huh? He has called you to himself and you are in a covenant relationship with him and he's looking to you to please him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse six and on without faith. It said, he that come to God must believe that he is and he is a reward of they that diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You got to recognize yourself. It doesn't matter if people are looking at my life, 1,000 people, 500 people. God and his angels are looking at me. That's one thing that make the church go to sleep. Because you look at, oh, I'm not in leadership. Oh, I'm not praying for the sick right now. Oh, I'm not healing the sick. Oh, I'm not raising the dead. You know, I'm not teaching the word right now. So you live filthy lives. You still smoke. You still uh, argue against the truth. You still run from the truth. You still hate correction. You still hate wisdom. You still hate uh, God telling you exactly what he wants. You love the lifestyle of walking in your own self-righteousness and offering up to God a Cain offering, and he don't want it. Isaiah, the prophet, talked about how you keep on giving vain sacrifices to God, and that's not what he wants. Remember, Jesus told the Pharisee, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the Lord. Meaning, don't put your faith in the Sabbath. Put your faith in the Lord of the Sabbath because the Lord may switch your Sabbath. You might try to do the Sabbath like everybody else, but if he's the Lord, he get to call the shots. Humility is when God takes away your confidence in your self-created schedule. That's what humility all about. He takes away your confidence. He purges you from your confidence in your self-created schedule. When you're in humility, you're deciding to let the father rule how he wants to rule you. How he wants to get pleasure from you. Mind your own business. Back to verse Thessalonians 4.11. That you study to live a quiet life. You study to live a quiet life and do your own business. Another text says, mind your own business. Some of y'all, when somebody die, you know that they die because you're nosy. When somebody alive, you know that they're alive. You know, you know how much rats there are in New York. Huh? Because you're nosy. 
But yet there's things that God wants you to complete for him in a day, but you can't attend to it because you're listening to all type of information systems. When you're nosy, you can't give God your best self because you're being dominated by other news, other views, other perspectives, other paths. You ever hear those people that they study ungodly people so much that they become ungodly? They talk about what people are doing wrong so much that they do wrong. What's going on? Because you got to mind your own business. Thessalonians 4.11 says, do your own business. Mind your own business. Work with your own hands. Don't worry about what people are doing. Some of you all, you need to throw away garments that you got for over five years. Throw them suckers away. Some of y'all did sin in certain garments and you still got those garments. You're not really smart. But you're smart after listening now because you're realizing how could you have a garment where you worship Satan? Why would you still want it in your presence? Why would you still want it in your house? Some of y'all got crosses inside of your house that's satanic. A cross. I remember years ago, let me tell you a story years ago. Now this really happened. I remember years ago, there was a guy at a gas station and he was so aggressive. He wanted to give somebody a cross. It was a cross and the man was so aggressive. And the spirit spoke to me and said, look at this cross right here. This is a witchcraft cult cross, he trying to curse them. And the person looked at the cross and they wanted to take it. And God said, look, as soon as they switch hands, that cross carrying witchcraft falling in them home. They looking at the cross. They're not looking at whether I'm with this. The symbolism is blinding them, deceiving them. And this is our generation. We think if somebody gives us a shirt that says John 3, 16, that is from God. You think that because somebody gives you a garment and the garment says Jesus is Lord. Oh, this is a holy garment. And the garment could be full of demons. Do you have eyes to see in the spirit? Because some of y'all don't. You can't even see what's in your house that's not of God. I, I've done this for years. For years, wherever I go, I can see the demons in the place. I can see the demons before the place. I can see the demons before I enter. I can know what I have to deal with, what I need to eject, what I need to remove. I've never brought anybody close to me without bringing a realization of what's in their house that's not of God. Because people can't see. I found that out a long time ago. I, I've met people that say that they prophet. I've met people say that they are apostolic. I've met people that say that they are, are in the spirit and they can't see their own house. So I know that they can't see. I've seen people celebrate stuff that was demonic. I know that they can't see. Me as a seer, as a prophet of God, that's why I come into your life. I come into your life because my sight system is not at your plateau. Is not at your di 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 dimension. And you can know that because when I show you something, how, how you didn't see it. And some of you all, you got more time on your hands than me. When I say that, I don't mean that me and you both don't got 24 hours. What I mean that I'm handling an assignment. Some of you all, you're in a place right now where you can actually pray and tell the Lord, Lord, show me what's in my house that's not of you. But you don't do that. But you scroll your phone. That's your IQ level. You scrolling your phone and you don't know what's of witchcraft in your presence. You're finding out who in sin and who missing God, but you're not finding out what's in your own presence. That's the craziness that man operate in. You can't see your own vineyard, but you're conscious of everybody else's. Some of you are, you know, when somebody dies, but you don't recognize when you die. The prophet, I'm not dead. I'm still alive today. They died. They're not alive today. Well, you dead too. 
if you're disconnected from what God wants you to see. You're dead too if you're disconnected from what God doesn't want. You're dead too. If you're disconnected from something that God would like to tell you. Saints, God ain't telling all of you all what you're supposed to know. Some of y'all are filthy right now. You will never know it because you won't go to God and ask him to clean you. You won't go to God and tell him, Lord, show me what's about me that's not of you. You won't do that. So he going to let you deceive yourself until you drop into the pit of hell. Until you fall into the lake of fire. He going to let you believe what you believe. And that's God. God will let you believe a lie all your life until you come to him and tell him, I'm tired of this mess. Tell me the truth, Lord. I don't want to live no decept deceptive, deceitful life. Tell me the truth about what you want. Tell me what's in my house that's not of you. Some of y'all don't pray like that. I don't know why you call yourself prophetic. Prophetic people are on the altar. I teach you about sowing because sowing is what you do on the altar. You sow yourself, you sow your mind, you sow your time, you sow your comfort, you sow your intellect, you sow your schedule, you sow your money. That's why I talk to you about an altar. Some of y'all talk about you so prophetic, but you're not prophetic. You pathetic. That's, that's what you real operate in. You operate in a pathetic spirit because you say that you're so close to God, but you don't even talk to God as if you're close. You don't even give God the platform to tell you raw stuff. Because you already said in your mind what you want to do. Saints, the history of my life, I've been around people before. History of my life, people tell me their plans. The Lord say, let them do what they do. That ain't my will, but just let them do what they do. You know why? Because man won't inquire of God. God don't interject where you don't seek. God don't interject where you don't seek. God don't interject where you don't seek. He don't interject where you don't seek. And whatever is not his vision, he doesn't protect. He doesn't release protection where it's not his vision. There's people that die all the time, dying, accidents, dying, different type of stuff. And it's not really the will of God for them to die, but they're in their own vision. There's no protection. Meanwhile, if somebody died like that, that don't always mean that they're not in God's vision. But what I'm saying to you is that things have been happening to people, generation and generation, that's not supposed to happen because they won't ask God for his will. They won't inquire of God what he wants. So God lets their life stay dusty. Let me just tell you this. I'm going to tell you this real raw. I'm going to tell you this real raw. And listen to me, people of God, so that you don't have no ignorance about these things. You're not going to live in the hundredfold if you're not somebody that's going to go to God and say, Lord, show me what is evil in my life, what is evil around me that I need to evict, change, purge. Show me whatever is bringing you displeasure about me so that I could be a better experience for you you're not going to make it to the hundredfold. You're not going to make it to eternal life. Till you got the mindset to say, Father, purge me. Make me right. You're going to have to do that by force. And then let me talk to you about another realm. Some of you all, you... You are uptight, not upright. When you're uptight, you walk, you walk in a wrong spirit. And it's your attempt to please God. Like you, like you believe that that will please God, but you're operating in a wrong spirit. Don't be uptight, be upright. God going to have you deal with people every now and again. There's some people you're going to have to know how to deal with them. Uh, you got to know what to say to people. Sometimes you, you're not in people's life to push down their throat to be saved. 
to be delivered. That's, that's not what God got you there. And some of you are, you shift the conversation over to spiritual stuff. You start messing up your finances. You shift the conversation. And not everybody won't hear spiritual stuff, but they're still assigned to uh, be a part of either your, your workplace, your provisional place, or your vision. Something that God is having you do there. They, like, for instance, watch this here. Say somebody come fix your air conditioner. You start telling them, oh, you know, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And, and they came to fix your air condition. Meanwhile, you see them start messing up in their work because they don't want to hear no Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You keep on telling them and stuff. And you, you're not saved? Why are you not saved? You know Jesus coming back? You tell, you tell, bop, 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 bop. Look, you got a wrong spirit. Number one, Jesus don't even operate like that. Jesus didn't go to people and say, hey, I'm the son of God. You going to receive me? Why not? You stupid? You stupid? You stupid? You're not going to receive me? Why? 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 You love me? 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 You know I created you? Love me? Love me? Want me? Want me? Want me? Look how he went to the woman at the well. Baby, give me some water. That woman was like, ooh, Jesus, you know, we're not supposed to talk to, uh, Jesus said, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know we're not supposed to talk, but, you know, that man that you with is not even your man, you know, see what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? See that man that you with, that's not even your man, you see what I'm saying? So according to According to the record, you still a pretty little thing that you need a little pretty little thing that little little ring. You see what I'm saying? A little pretty little thing near ring and some tangs. You see what I'm saying? A little pretty little thing with near little ring, a little little little, little, little ching chain. You see what I'm saying? Ping ping ping, t pain. You see what I'm saying? Buy you a drink. Buy me a drink first. Buy me a drink first. T pain. Give me a little. Give me a little tea pain, buy me a drink. Be a, little, be a little drink, you see what I'm saying? You little, little, little thing. Your dad won't give away all your goods to these five men. You gonna walk out the house, hair all looking all rough. They ain't even fix your hair today. You got five of them, they still ain't hook you. Nails looking like Saddam Hussein. They still ain't hook you. They still ain't hook you. That's, Bypass all that. Let me just say this. Some of you, some of you, some of you right now, some of y'all, you got you got big old claw nails right now. Listen, this is not to condemn you. I'm, I'm let me keep to my storyline. But Jesus didn't go around trying to force people, you know, you, you better see me, you better see me. He walked up to him. Hey, hey baby, give me a drink. <laughs> give me a drink. I want I want a drink. Mm-hmm. Give me a drink. I'll give you. And then he told her, I'll give you a drink. I'm the real, I'm the real one that I'm trying to give you a drink. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just making it seem like I'm the no, no, you the one need to drink from me. I got the water that won't make you'll never run dry. I got the water for eternal life. Saints. You notice, Jesus didn't come in with some force. You better receive me. You better receive me. He came in with gentleness, persuasion, charisma. His advertisement was legit. She actually wanted to be with Jesus. Because the five men, she had never experienced anything like that. Here's Jesus, a man with a vision, a man with power, a man with charisma, a man with manners, a man with love, presence of love, a man that's actually interested in her for the right reasons. Not to duxa, but to deliver well, deliver and took sense. <laughs> well, <laughs> but 
Wait, I can't say that. Got to use another word now. Anyhow. <laughs> so, 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 look, look at what, look what, look what transpired here. She pit off five Bojangles for one. King. Now watch this here. Let's look at the mathematics here. That means that five equaled one. <laughs> five. Five. Five equaled one. I want you to catch this here. That means that five of those men together did not have the quality of Jesus himself. How this woman was wasting her virtue, her potential in an unauthorized garden, unauthorized events. Now, saints, we look at this woman at the well, but this is the story of the whole human population. They waste their time, relationships, their qualities. They never reach the one, Jesus himself, who is calling them to give him pleasure. Blessed is the man that chooses to become a water giver to Christ, a food giver to Christ, a provider of pleasure to Christ. Blessed is the one that will give unto God their duty, their diligence, 